Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Mark Collins, Brand Partnerships Director at Electric House. And firstly, I just want to say thank you to everyone very much for attending. And I hope you and your families are all keeping safe and well during these challenging times. For those of you uh, who are on the call that are not familiar with Electric House, uh, we are a social media publishing group. We create, we publish, and we distribute video content. Electric House owns and operates the On The Tools and On A Budget UK-based communities and of course the groups within them. Um, in 2019, uh, On The Tools was consistently watched by more UK males than anyone else, which is something we're extremely proud of. And as you can see there, there are some huge names such as Sky Sports, Channel 4 and Lad Bible. It also goes to show that although the UK construction industry is made, of, made up of approximately 3 million people, the content we create is far-reaching and goes way beyond the construction industry demographic. So today we'll be discussing how social distancing is changing the role of social media and also the power of brand purpose, plus industry insight looking into the impact on audiences and communities, consumer trends and how your brand can be maximising marketing on social. Plus, at the end, there's a chance to win a £50 voucher in our 10-question virtual quiz. And just a heads up, everyone, pay attention, as there may be a couple of questions related to the actual presentation itself. Uh, just on questions, if you do have any, please feel free to get these in throughout the talks or at the end of each session. You can do this by clicking the three dots at the bottom of your screen and selecting the chat, and then I'll read them out and, uh, to, to the relevant speakers. So, just bear with me a moment. So just quickly, I'm gonna run through the agenda. So we'll have uh, Will Bonadio, who will be looking at how social distancing is changing the role of social media. We'll have then have Adam Barry, uh, who will look at how quarantine has affected the UK construction industry. Andy Taylor will talk about the on a budget community and the benefits of groups and, and consumer trends. And then finally, we'll have Dan Lucas, who's our quiz master. Uh, and as I said before, there's a 50 pound uh, voucher up for grabs there. So uh, starting with Will and how social distancing cha is changing the role of social media. And just by way of introduction, he is an award-winning marketer and international keynote speaker. Will is the senior client partner in London for social media publishing group, Electric House. Having previously worked agency side on brands such as Disney and Domino's Pizza, as well as in-house at McDonald's UK as their social media editor-in-chief, Will now supports brands of all sizes in creating, producing, distributing and amplifying video content through Electric House's dedicated social media communities, which deliver over 30 million video views each and every week. Will, over to you. Thank you, Mark, and uh, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. I'm sorry that we're not going to be able to do this all in the same room today. I'm trying to channel the Electric House offices with my background, um, but I am grateful that we are able to do this on a webinar because it means that we get to speak to more of you at the same time, so there is that, that benefit. Um, so I'm going to start this presentation by trying not to use the word unprecedented. I know that is a massive cliche at the moment, so much so that even if I say the word unprecedented is a cliche, that is a cliche in itself at this point in time. But what I will say is that at least at the beginning, this is an unprecedented situation um, and we truly are all in this together. So, you know, if you look at when we talk about World Cup fever sweeping the nation, um, people will say, you know, it's absolutely everywhere. But the fact of the matter is, there's still a lot of people that actually don't care about the World Cup. Uh, my wife, my ex-flatmate, uh, my best friend, my mother, they really don't have a clue about the World Cup, nor will they care at all. So yes, it really affects a large amount of people, but not in the way that this does. Similarly, Brexit, um, you know, that was all people were talking about for four years. Um, but actually how that affected you could really differ. You know, if you voted in, um, you would obviously be very upset with the result. But if you voted leave, some people are absolutely ecstatic and, you know, what they felt that that would mean for them and the opportunities that would give them. So affecting people in very different ways. But the situation that we are now in, um, in lockdown, in quarantine with a global pandemic, you know, this really is affecting everybody in a negative way in, to some extent. You know, we're all in lockdown. 
We're unable to t spend time with our friends. We're unable to hug our loved ones that we don't live with, unable to get on with our daily lives as we used to. Um, and so for the first time, really, I would say in our lifetime, the people that are on this right now, um, this is the first thing like it and, and we truly are all in this together. So as a social media publisher, what we're really interested in is how social distancing is changing the role of social media. Um, and we've done some significant research into this, which is what I'm gonna take you through now. So if I take you back to 2019, pre-COVID-19, um, and we, if you just look at why people normally use social media, and these are the top four reasons. So first and foremost, to stay up to date with news and current events. Uh, second to that, to stay in touch with what my friends are doing then to find funny or entertaining content uh, and then the fourth biggest reason but by no means the last uh, is to fill up spare time and i kind of feel like all of these are just as relevant now as they were back then in fact probably more so um, electric house obviously really specializes in those last two particularly with um, our communities but um spare time is definitely something that people have a lot more of now and so i feel like all of these things have never been more relevant and so if we go now to what's happening you know in the last month what we've seen is that the most popular online activity in march was searching for covid19 updates um, that is the number one but what else are people doing what we found is that a lot of the other online activities relate to being entertained and filling up on this spare time that we know people have now. So if this is the list underneath that top one, you know, listening to music, watching movies and shows, watching funny videos, playing games on mobile, looking at memes or quarant memes as they're now being called, playing games on the PC or laptop and searching for cooking recipes. And this is something that we're going to be drilling down into a lot more as I go through this. Um, and yeah, COVID-19, because of this spare time and um, being in lockdown, it's actually changed the way that we're consuming media. So if we look at um, people who've said uh, they've started consuming or are consuming more of the following since the outbreak, when it comes to Gen Z, they're really pivoting towards consuming even more online video, online TV or streaming and music streaming. When we look at millennials, Again, online video, online TV and streaming are really big for them at the moment. They're really doing more of that than ever, but then also online press as well as music streaming. And then if we look at the slightly older demographic of Gen X, what we see is yes, online video and online TV, um, but also a massive pivot towards broadcast TV as well as online press. So really the themes that are coming through there is that um, TV, the most popular um, for increased media consumption is broadcast TV, online video and online TV streaming. 80% of the UK say they're consuming more content online. And so you know, it's, it's online video in all these guises that are seeing this. And so you know, we've been talking about online video a lot as part of Electric House. It's something that we really specialize in. I was literally on a webinar last week talking about how we approach that. But what we're seeing now is uh, it's, it's continuing to grow. If it wasn't already massively established, which we feel it was, online video is actually set to grow even more. And 58% of people who are watching online video in the UK say they plan to consume just as much of this content when the outbreak is over. So it's going to get significantly bigger over the next few weeks. And according to 58% of the UK, they're going to keep consuming that much um, or aim to be consuming as, as much as they are right now once this is over too. Now, we haven't talked too much about keeping in touch with one another yet, but what we're seeing is that um, WhatsApp is definitely the one winning. So 77% of millennials are using WhatsApp to keep in touch with people. That 77% of millennials is the biggest in terms of um, a certain age group, but across all age groups, WhatsApp is the most popular across all generations, genders, and incomes across the UK. We know that Facebook have been talking about um, advertising on WhatsApp and how that is likely to be coming in in the next year. So now now is the time to start um, thinking about what your WhatsApp strategy could be if you haven't already. Brands are already using it for customer services. Some brands are also creating or joining private group chats. Um, but WhatsApp, we know it's absolutely massive already. And I think off the back of this, with so many more people using it and using it more often, um, it's going to be even bigger than ever. And in terms of Instagram, you know, sticking with the companies owned by Facebook, 
people have more time to consume and to create content. So over the last month, we've seen a 15% increase in Instagram stories posted per day and people are consuming more as well. So there's been a 21% increase in Instagram stories impressions. And by that, we mean uh, when a story appears on the phone. So when it comes to looking for uh, news around COVID-19, you know, virus info, like we say, that's the number one thing that people are doing at the moment. Facebook is the one that people are using the most. Um, even with Gen Z, who you know, historically people would have said um, they don't use Facebook as much, you know, younger people aren't using it as much as kind of what people are saying. But even now, um, Gen Z are still using it more than any other platform. So when I first looked at this data, it's like, okay, cool, Facebook is where it's happening. But actually, what we're seeing is an even greater majority say that they don't trust social media content about the virus. So where are they going instead to get their COVID 19 news? Well, the UK's most trusted sources of virus info are the government website, followed by the World Health Organization. And after that is newspapers, so physical newspapers that you can hold or um, online press as well. But we've got a bit of a problem here. Um, unlike America, we as a nation really trust our newspapers far more than they do in the US. But the problem that we've got is that people aren't actually willing to pay for this news. And so you've got this really ironic situation where the traffic to newspaper websites has never been bigger. But the problem is because a lot of the um, content that's being consumed is talking about viruses, death and um, negative, previously um, thought of as uh, unsafe keywords for brands, what's happening is programmatic and display buys aren't showing ads next to this content. And so it's estimated that the newspaper companies are losing about 50 million or have done already 50 million pounds in revenue because they've got record breaking traffic figures, but actually ads that aren't appearing next to these pages and therefore they're losing out on that. Now, in terms of what people want to see when they're looking at their COVID-19 news, recovery rates and positive stories are the top demands for what the UK wants to see. But actually what we're seeing as well is that a third of UK consumers want to see topics completely unrelated to the coronavirus. So this is basically what 33% of the UK is doing right now. So what do they want to see? Well, social video consumption has really changed over the last month. So this is looking at averages for 2019 and the type of video content that was consumed versus um, content consumed in March up to the 24th. And as you can see, health and fitness, people and lifestyle and food and drink topics around video have seen an absolutely massive increase in average views. So let's look into that in a little bit more detail. So people are finally starting to go live. There should be a Joe Wicks little gif here, if we can get that to work, cool. So Joe Wicks first workout was seen by nearly a million people and he's become, he's kind of elected himself as the nation's PE teacher. Um, and yeah, he got a world record for the number of views of that first one and he continues to do it on a, every weekday. Um, people are spending two hours watching national theatre plays every Thursday. So these are real professional plays that you would normally see in the West End, obviously not possible anymore. And they're broadcasting it and people are watching it. Celebrities are opening their doors and their phones to allow you to get a glimpse into what they're up to. So you can win a date with um, uh, Amelia Clark from Game of Thrones. You can do Ask Me Anything with Will Smith. Um, they're doing it as competitions, but they're also just doing it for free as well, for, you know, for anyone to join. And quizzes, 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 quizzes. Quizzes are everywhere at the moment, including on this call. Um, there's been ones for Harry Potter, friends, the kind of things you would see in pubs because obviously people can't go to the pubs, but also a recent pub quiz had Sir Ian McKellen and Helen, Millen, uh, Helen Mirren on it as well. So that's like on, a, on an almost daily basis. Electric House has been a big fan of using live and doing quizzes as well. You know, there are advertising opportunities that we offer on our pages, but I think after this, you're gonna see a lot more people using it as well. It's gonna become a lot more of the norm than it was before. Um, and if you're interested in looking at different lives, um, I'd strongly recommend you check out the Time Out Instagram page because they do a daily update of what to stream for the day, which is really helpful. Now, at the time of writing this presentation last week, House Party was the biggest um, app. It was top of the charts um, across the iTunes, um, uh, the iPhone app, app store. And it's seen a 3000% increase in downloads in the last month. 
Now this morning I had a quick check just before this call and Zoom is currently at the top, which is obviously what we're using here. It is a video conferencing app. Um, and that's because hangouts with your friends are just impossible at the moment. And like the CEO of House Party said about his own app, this is the next best thing to hang out in real life, which is exactly what people want to be doing. And so I'd really encourage you to be thinking about how you can use video conferencing or video chat uh, for your brand. And, and a nice example of this is what Burger King recently did. So Burger King have um, released some Zoom backgrounds. And if you use the backgrounds and take a picture of it and share it to social, you will get a free Whopper once this is over. Food, like we saw as well, has been um, massively increased in consumption um, from an online video perspective with brands and customers sharing recipes. So everybody is doing this from Greg's, KFC and Nando's telling you how to create your favorites, which you can't get at the moment. Pizza Express has given away the recipe for the dough balls. Even Ikea has told you how to make the meatballs uh, in their shop so you can relive the pain of a trip to Croydon uh, in the comfort of your own home. Um, the Michelin Guide, if you check them out on Instagram, they are now revealing the secrets behind the Michelin star dishes that you can recreate at home. I was quite shocked to see how simple some of them actually are. Um, and this is the thing, people have more time than ever, so they're willing to do more experimentation. There's a massive shortage of flour at the moment because everybody is trying to make sourdough bread. Um, I don't see that as something that's gonna continue after this. I think it's because at the moment people have more time. I think with online video, you're able to put it into your lunch break, onto the commutes at work, etc. cetera. Um, but now is the time if you're at all um, involved in food that you can really capitalize on the, the fact that people have so much more time. And so what we're seeing is there's a new uh, trend with a coffee called Dalgona, um, which has really taken over. It's even got news coverage like from the national press and it's basically a whipped coffee that takes 20 minutes to prepare. And I don't think people would have been willing um, at such a large scale to be spending 20 minutes whipping up a coffee, but um, they've got a lot more time to be able to do it. Um, and you know, they've got less resources as well. And so this is a video that we created for our on a budget page where we took ingredients to come up with a recipe that only costs three pounds 50. So we took you through the different ingredients using um, Easter eggs. It was posted at the time of Easter and this did absolutely massive numbers for us. Um, and it's, I think it's quite interesting to see as well what other advertisers are doing. Even if you wouldn't necessarily expect them to be associated with food, they can see the opportunity and the, um, the appetite for this, if you'll excuse the pun. So Ralph Lauren recently, they're not talking about their clothes as much on their socials, but they are talking about their homeware range. And so they were doing cocktail recipes um, that obviously use the, the official glassware. So there are opportunities for people, even if you might not think straight away. Um, TikTok. So TikTok has been on marketers' lips a lot for the last year. Is this the point where it actually goes mainstream is my question. I think a big problem in the past has been that over 30s haven't really got it. But um, you know, with families in lockdown, uh, older generations being exposed to it via their kids, even Gordon Ramsay here, um, it's really bringing people together. And it's also making it a lot more accessible to those who might not have been in that kind of teenage market that previously we would have associated with TikTok. There are 5 million UK users at the moment using the app. Um, it's predicted that this will go up to 10 million by 2021, but I would say at the current rate, it's probably gonna do that quicker than that. Um, the World Health Organization has entered an official partnership with TikTok, so that they've been using it to spread accurate and timely information and also offer Q and A's with um, representatives from there so that you can answer questions that you've got about the disease. Um, and then also uh, TikTok has um, introduced a happy at home daily series. So they've been working with online influencers um, that you know, probably only teenagers will know, but even big celebrities like Arnold Schwarzenegger is on there giving inspirational talks. So tune in for that <laughs> if that's your kind of thing. Um, but it looks like TikTok is really something that marketers need to start to take more seriously, um, particularly if it continues to grow at this current rates and it starts to appeal broader than just teenagers. Um, which is what we're starting to see it's doing. And, and that's what we've got as presence on there already. So I guess, you know, in summary of that section, what we're seeing is that I would argue social media is starting to feel a lot more social than it was before um, and, and it had become. So you know, people are using it to get together virtually. Um, they're sharing ideas and recipes with one another. They're communicating more and they're really taking part. Like social truly is a, a social um, place now. 
And I definitely think there is a role that brands can play in this, but it's really never been more important to consider your brand purpose as part of it, particularly in the current climate. So what do we mean by brand purpose? What we're talking about is a higher order reason for a brand to exist more than just making a profit. Um, and my recommendation for that is it starts with your employees. And so you really need to deliver real action, not just words. And employees, that is the primary audience of your brand's purpose more than customers. And I'll go into a bit more detail about that now, but uh, that should be your primary audience. Uh, and the brand purpose is there to guide your actions above anything else. Um, and customers really do care about this. So a recent research from Kantar in the last month uh, asked customers what they're expecting from the brands they choose. And the biggest re uh, thing that they were expecting, 78% of customers expect brands to take care of employees' health and 62% believe they should implement flexible working. And then if we go down further into the research, we see 41% expect brands to support hospitals and 35% expect brands to help the government. So customers really do care about this and unprompted, this is the kind of things that they're saying, but it starts with employees. And so a few examples of brands that have been doing this really well. So Pret is uh, one of the earliest examples when this first started. So they almost immediately closed their seating areas uh, to operate on a takeaway only basis. Um, and they also offered free hot drinks to NHS workers, as well as offering a 50% discount on all other products. So really rapidly gaining public support. And they, they did that, you know, as soon as there was talk even of potential changes to the way that we were going to be living. They didn't wait until the lockdown. Innocent smoothies, um, innocent drinks, looking after people and the planet. There's probably not a single presentation I give where I don't mention innocent in some way. They are absolutely brilliant at social media. I'm sure you know that. Um, but I think they've really come into their own and really stepped up that game even more in the last few weeks. So they do daily updates on social. They include funny pet photos and you know, 100 silly things to do this weekend, like debobbling a jumper in order to pass the time, um, in, all in a classic innocent style. But they're really um, walking the walk as well with regards to their brand purpose about you know making it a better planet for a better place for the planet and for its people. So they've been giving excess drinks to hospital workers and to food banks. They've donated a million euros to charities tackling the crisis. Um, they're spending uh, they're sending smoothies to families who claim free school meals. They've set up a pen pal service for the elderly and they've heard their staff um, and the efforts that they've taken for, for fundraising or going above and beyond in order to help during the pandemic. Um, so yeah, definitely worth checking them out if you haven't already. And I think all supermarkets have done a really good job as well. Um, you know, I feel like Sainsbury's write to me on a very regular basis to let me know what's going on in my local store and what changes they're making to be able to help the, um, the most vulnerable. But I think Morrison's have done a particularly good job. So, you know, they've changed their brand purpose at the moment to be that of feeding the nation. And they've created a range of food parcels, including options for vegetarians, which are easy to order. They've expanded their home deliveries to those in needs, but also from a um, employee perspective, they've introduced guarantees on sick pay. So whether you are at home ill or you are simply self-isolating, they've made sure that they've covered their employees. They're committing to pay suppliers faster to relieve the financial pressures on small businesses. Um, and they're recruiting more pickers and drivers in order to meet the demand for more deliveries. So they've actually created 3,500 jobs, uh, new jobs in the process. So these are the brands that are doing it well. Um, obviously we need to look at some other examples as well. I don't want to touch on this too much, but I want to give you just a bit of a, um, an overview because basically I think Ian Hodson, Baker's Union president puts it best when he says, this country will not forget the way in which employers have treated their staff um, during this crisis. And you know, Britain's, Real customers, real consumers really do care about this. So if we take the example when you know, the news was first coming out, um, we saw that in the same week that Brewdog were announcing that their founders would be taking no pay during this crisis, um, Weatherspoon's owner, Tim Martin, announced that his staff wouldn't be paid until the government stepped in. Uh, and there was a video of him suggesting that they were, should join Tesco instead. So this is a brand buzz um, score. Uh, report which basically shows positive and negative sentiment around brands and you can see that at the time of that JD Weatherspoon's video uh, the buzz you know the negative sentiment it really becomes very negative whereas Brewdog starts to get higher instead and actually yeah, I, I've seen I'm a member of a, um, a marketing whatsapp group 
and uh, there's a, an Excel spreadsheet doing the rounds, which literally shows brands listed out the positives that they've been doing during this and the negatives as well. And people are really commenting on this. People are updating it on a regular basis. I'm happy to share it with anybody on this call if you want to um, get in contact with me afterwards. But, you know, people are looking at this a lot and people will remember once this is over. So how now if brands, we know, we know what brand purpose is, but how can you get your marketing right? And indeed, should you be marketing at all during this um, current moment? Well, 92% of consumers believe that brands do need to keep advertising because a lot of them are really desperate for that sense of normality, um, that bit of distraction and entertainment from this round the clock uh, news coverage that we're getting. And when talking about the benefits of long-term benefits of advertising, I have to go back to Peter Field. So if you aren't familiar with it, I'd strongly recommend that everybody reads a, a paper by Peter Field called The Long and Short of It, which talks about the benefits of long-term brand advertising um, compared to more like short-term product and price-led you know, quick win campaigns and how really to grow a brand over the years it is really important to not forget about brand building activity and, and really you want to do about a 60 40 um, split I could do an entire presentation or entire afternoon talking about that so I'm not going to go into too much detail but I can share it with you um, but what he's seen is he's recently done a new paper um, and a new talk which looks at the 2008 financial crisis and what are the lessons that we can learn coming out of that recession and he found that brands achieving an excess share of voice over 8%, um, their annualized market share growth was 4.5% on average. So therefore, what we're seeing is that brand really matters right now, more so than short-term sales messaging, um, which can feel a bit unsympathetic to customers' moods. Um, and also, as, as advertisers, we may struggle to be able to keep up with that demand anyway. Um, so in terms of that share of voice, what we're seeing from an electric house perspective is that because less people are advertising at the moment and there's actually more traffic than ever, we're seeing a 57% decrease in our cost per like of a page. And we're also seeing a 44% decrease in cost per thousand impressions. So if you are running Facebook or Instagram ads or Twitter ads at the moment on a cost per thousand basis, um, you actually don't need to spend as much in order to maintain or grow your share of voice because um, the, the marketplace is less competitive at the moment. And if we go into, uh, go back to the study, um, brands are achieving an excess share of voice um, over 8% are actually seeing very large profit growth as well. Um, and this is something that Procter and Gamble are doing in order to maintain what they refer to as mental availability. So I guess, look, this is a, a big study that I can share the link to. I've tried to distill it into two slides, but really what we're trying to say here and, and what Peter Field is saying is that it's really important to focus on the long term. It's really important to defend your share of voice. There is a, an opportunity to seize here because it's a less competitive market and your competitors are not necessarily spending as much. Um, and don't withdraw brand advertising unless your short-term survival depends on it. Um, and as Jane Osler, who's the um, global head of media at Kantar said, brand health becomes vulnerable when companies stop advertising. So how do we create content during quarantine? We know that we want to keep advertising. We know that there's an opportunity there, but how do we do it? And this is something that our really talented in-house production team have been working on really well recently. And so there's some really quick wins. So animation and illustration, you don't need a big studio to do that. You just need a laptop and the skill to be able to do it. So that's um, a really quick win in terms of being able to create content. Um, think about how you can edit existing assets. So what have you got already that you can use? Um, user generated content can be massively valuable um, and people are continuing to create that. Um, and embrace the new normal. You know, we're all in this together, like I said. We know that everybody is, st is stuck at home. Um, and so brands are able to convey that and people are expecting to see it. So this is a nice example from Tesco, which was recently posted. showing people at home cooking, making the best of the situation. And this is a portrait ad that was actually shown on TV. Normally on TV, you would expect to see widescreen, but they know that this is the kind of thing that people are expecting to see and are able to create. 
this is Nike. Nike, who we know do big bombastic ads. Um, they did a two hour marathon last year, but what they're sticking with is, um, you know, they're encouraging people to play inside, to play for the world. And they're doing that with a black and white image because it gets the message across and this has been extremely successful. And then Budweiser as well, they've recently updated their WhatsApp ad, but they've changed the words to be around being in quarantine. Um, so people love that, you know, reminiscing about back to the good old days, back when things were normal, but it's still updated. It's still funny, but it's, um, it's updated for the current time. So in terms of setting the tone right with your ads, what I'd recommend is stay true to your brand. Think hard about what makes you, you. Don't be a pretender, otherwise you risk looking like a lot of these ads that have been criticized, which have, you know, heartfelt piano music and saying we're there for you. Like there's no shame in being who you are um, and really embracing that at the current time. Connect and empathize as much as you can. Show human connection, but still being aware of the situation. Adapt to consumer needs um, and really do that on an ongoing basis. This is changing very quickly, very regularly. So always be looking out for what the current mood is and what people are talking about. Check for insensitive words, obviously profanity, but what we're also talking about here is words like contagious content or a killer deal, or even you know talking about parties or get togethers. Those are just gonna come across as really tone deaf at the moment. Um, there is still a role for appropriate humor. As I said, you know, people are looking for lightheartedness to distract from the pandemic. Think contribution more than conversion, avoid price and item focused messaging. Um, and where possible, you know, people are longing for that sense of normality and distraction. So ads that are set in the past or that go back to a better time and remind people of everything, um, you know, that this, this will be over soon um, and that things will go back to a, a sense of normality it will be received well. So this is the last slide of my presentation, but what I want to really finish on is just, you know, think about if nothing else, just be useful. What are your customers' pain points? What can... Um, what does this mean to be useful for your brand specifically? If they're bored and they're in self-quarantine, could you offer them some sort of long-form distraction? Uh, could you reshare old content for some light relief? Um, are they anxious about job losses? Can you offer some advice? Just think about how your brand can be of the most use right now to your customers while they're consuming more social media content than ever. Um, and I promise it will benefit your brand in the long term. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, some really, really uh, useful insight there. Um, uh, got, for everyone on the call, apologies if, if you didn't get the audio on those videos. I know I certainly didn't, but um, obviously we'll, we'll, of course, send this uh, link out to you uh, so you can read through and, and watch the videos in your own time as well. Uh, just the one question so far, uh, if anyone else does have any questions, please get them in the chat using the... If you click on the three dots at the bottom of the screen, uh, you'll be able to see the chat option there. Uh, Will, first one from Tom Hitch. With the Tesco ad in mind, are we going to be as worried about going back to high production ads? Uh, a lot of, uh, of the more organic content is performing. Will that still work post lockdown? Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to talk purely from a social perspective. Obviously, that was a social ad that was also used on TV. I would, I mean, I've been banging that drum for a number of years now, like social, and we, we talk about this with Electric House, creates um, ads that don't look like, and feel like ads. And so, you know, in my McDonald's days, some of the best performing social posts we did were shot on a phone and were very simple and did look more like your friend had posted it or more like a meme. So... I think this is good news and I, I would encourage you to be doing that anyway. Um, but yes, I definitely think that that will become a kind of a new norm for more people as a result. And I, I certainly hope so. Great. Thanks. Um, another couple of questions um, just come in uh, from Harrison Moore. Hi, thanks for that. Uh, please could you share with me the spreadsheet follow? Oh, so apologies. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll of course share that. It's not a question. Um, and then Pollyanna Ward um, posted, uh, sorry, uh, if they don't trust it, why, uh, why are they looking there, do you think? Uh, this is on the social media and trust slide. Yeah, I think, um, you know, the, the thing about uh, the newsfeed is that it, the content comes to you rather than you going to pages to look for it necessarily. So I think it can't be avoided in some ways. And I think, um, you know, with so much spare time, people are, looking at social a lot more. I literally will look at Instagram, close it, and then forget that I've just done that, open it again instantly. And I'm sure a lot of the people on this call do as well. So I think that's where it is um, and that's where people are. Um, but even though people are consuming it and they're seeing it, um, potentially not out of choice, 
they're wary of it because they know it's not necessarily as trustworthy as content that's coming from the government or the World Health Organization. Great, thanks. Well, there's no more questions, but obviously uh, if, if anybody does have any, um, we'll look to get back to you uh, separately on that. I'm just conscious of time. So uh, moving on then, um, we're gonna look now at how quarantine has affected the UK construction industry. Uh, this will be, uh, Adam Barry will take us through this. He is the co-founder and creative director of Electric House. Starting his career as an apprentice in the construction industry, over the next 12 years, he had a number of roles, including shop footing, site and project management, before setting up his own businesses, refurbishing uh, offices. Uh, Adam then jumped off the tools to co-found leading community on the tools with Lee Wilcox. With a wealth of construction knowledge under his belt, Adam not only understands the community they built, he is also a part of it. Adam now, uh, Adam now leads the Electric House creative team working across some of the UK's leading brands to create award-winning campaigns. Over to you, Adam. Thank you, Mark. That was a, a lovely intro, much appreciated. Um, before everyone leaves and thinks, uh, what has construction got to do with me? I think many of you on the webinar will have construction workers as your audience and whether that's um, you sell them a, a product or a service directly. Um, don't forget these people are also out there shopping in supermarkets and buying online. So I think it's very important for you to understand how they're feeling right now. Um, so what I'm going to talk you through today is, is the current climate um, and how it's affecting the industry where this leaves our tradespeople uh, and what we can do uh, to help them. So um, give me a second. I don't think I'm linked to this. Um, my slides aren't moving. There's always a, oh, there we go. Uh, before I start, I know Mark touched on it, but On The Tools is the largest online construction community in the UK. Uh, we've got 4.6 million followers uh, across our social channels. Um, and as you can see, the, uh, the demographic there reflects the industry itself. It's, uh, it's mainly male. Um, and last year, our content was consistently watched uh, by more UK males than any other publisher. So that sort of sets the scene. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so how, how has quarantine affected the industry? Um, I think more often than not, the construction industry is left behind and forgotten uh, compared to other sectors, especially over the last few weeks. It seems tradespeople are at the back of the queue when it comes to being offered support uh, and clear government guidelines. Self-employed uh, tradespeople have been hit hard in particular. Those unable to go to work are having to wait until June until they receive the government grant, meaning that some workers would have had to wait over two months to receive any form of income. So just for a moment, I want you all to imagine you're in their shoes. It's the middle of March and you're not gonna receive any income at all until June and this is what they're facing. So if you're self-employed, employed or a business owner, and you're not working on what's classed as essential jobs, there's a good chance that you won't be able to get hold of materials or sites have been closed down. Uh, we've recently run a, a Facebook poll on the Other Tools Facebook page after the government's announcement to extend the lockdown period for another three weeks. And, and we asked everyone uh, who's still continuing to work and out of 38,000 respondents, 45% of the audience said they're still going to work. So whichever way you look at this, both sets of people face some very challenging issues, those that are at home and those that are continuing to go to work. So where does this leave our tradespeople? Those that are out of work and are staying at home uh, face financial trouble because of the lack of support from the government. But it's not just financial trouble they're facing. It's no secret that if you work in construction, you're three times more likely to take your own life. And this isn't a coincidence. The industry as a whole is... Um, it's very archaic. So when it comes to physical, mental and financial support, um, think of things like health insurances, pensions, holiday pay and sick pay. We're behind compared to most of the sectors and the current climate definitely isn't helping this. Those that are continuing to work are feeling the strain in uh, other areas um, and most of them feel like they have no choice but to carry on. So they're putting their, their finances, their, their, their income before their health. It's almost impossible to stick to government guidelines when working on site as well. Um, so you're unable to sit more than two meters away from someone in the cab of a van. Uh, and, and so many trades have to work together in tight spaces on site. Uh, and certain tasks need to be carried out between two people closer than two meters. So this is leading to health and safety breaches too. Uh, trades people are feeling guilty <clears throat> for going to work. Uh, they're being told to only work on essential projects. If you ask any working tradesperson if it's essential work, 
they'll tell you it is because it enables them to keep a roof over the head. So the guidelines uh, really aren't that clear. Um, let's take uh, Matt Hancock's latest announcement on building sites, uh, staying, hope, staying open. He said it's fine for those businesses to stay open because they were never required to close by social uh, distancing rules. Um, I'm not sure if Matt Hancock's ever been on a building site before, but it's nearly impossible to adhere to the rules. Um, not only that, but the term building sites doesn't cover the whole industry. There's still hundreds of thousands of workers unable to go to work because the public are worried about them uh, coming into their homes, the, um, the shop fitting and refurbishments of retail stores, care homes, uh, things like restaurants, salons and offices. They've all been put on hold. So they're facing a, a really, really challenging time at the minute. So what can we do to help? I think uh, the main thing we can do is, is talk to our audience and our customers. They need us now more than ever. And if you're fortunate enough to still be able to get your product or service to your customers, then just keep them updated. Uh, the industry isn't just worried about what's happening now. They're worried, about, they're worried about what's coming. They're worried about the supply chain and when things actually pick up in a few weeks or months. Is there going to be a shortage in materials? Should they be pricing jobs differently? Um, is there anything they can be doing now to prepare for when things actually get back to normal? Those that are sat at home and are able to work, think of ways you can support them uh, mentally and physically. So just coming back on to uh, the stuff Will was talking about, it could be a pub quiz on your own social channels, um, simplif simplifying advice from the government, or even, uh, again, like home workout routines like Joe Wicks. There's no better time than now um, to reach your audience on social media. Um, I've got a few examples coming up. Hopefully the videos play with sound. Um, there's, there's a couple of examples from brands, and there's an example uh, that we've done as well. <clears throat> so this one is from Tax Scouts. We put a post out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram uh, regarding the COVID-19 income support scheme uh, and the CIS tax rebates, which is obviously uh, quite a big topic in the industry at the minute if you're self-employed. Asking our audience if they had any questions they needed answering. We put those questions to the tax specialist, tax scouts, uh, and created a video that gave uh, clear and, and factual answers. <clears throat> this again, this was filmed during lockdown, so um, we, we got um, tax scouts to film at their end, we filmed some our end, and then we got the editing uh, put together. That didn't work, as I thought. Hopefully this does. The audio's not working for me, Adam. Um... I think I might just skip through these and then explain them. Uh, that's, that's not a problem. Um, <clears throat> so, as I just said, uh, we got sort of like the, the, the frequently asked questions uh, and then we put them to the specialists and then they answered them in a real nice uh, digestible way. Um, so tradespeople are looking uh, for that, that easy to understand advice on issues surrounding self-employment. Uh, and you can tell from looking at the comments section, it was really well received. And also the stats there uh, on the left hand side. Um, give me a second. Get on to the next slide. Love, love when things go wrong on webinars. There we go. Um, I'm not gonna play this video because it hasn't got sound, so um, it kind of takes it away. But this is, uh, this is Talking Trade. It's a weekly on the tool show um, that we host on Facebook Live and it connects the industry in a time uh, where we feel they need it the most. So we launched this last week. Um, and it's completely different to what we normally do. It's very, very serious. There's nothing, nothing really funny happening in it. Um, but Adam, it's been, excuse yes? me. Do you want to just try play now? It, uh, I believe it okay. may work. Let's give it a go. Connor Russon. I hope I pronounced your name right, mate. Um, again, great question. What is the actual rules? I'm the same financially. need to go back to work being self-employed. But there's one rule for one, one for another. Um, he's got a pal who's a sparky going back to work because it's government funded site and they're obviously losing money. So, Jen, it's back to this point. Big sites seem to be opening up. The Wimpies, the Persimmons, the Barretts, all the big boys. Um, but the likes of us three that are self-employed tradespeople, it's a lot harder, isn't it? Great, Adam. That worked. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, it's not all, uh, not all bad. It's presented by tradespeople uh, too, and, and all the guests involved, the guests you can see there, they're, they're all involved within the construction industry. So <clears throat> naturally it tackles the, the real issues which are relevant to tradespeople right now. And because it's live, it also gives our community the chance 
to get their questions, uh, issues or concerns talked about uh, by industry professionals. And I actually, this is my favorite piece of content. I'm going to say that because, because we created it, but um, it shows that you don't need lots of equipment to produce engaging and impactful content right now. People are used to seeing this form of content, like Will said, uh, not just on social, but across TV as well. Uh, and the last one is, uh, is from CITB. <clears throat> so this one was actually created just before the lockdown, uh, but we could have still done this video with a voiceover uh, and without the presenter. Uh, and they want to show how sort of committed they are in giving clear guidance, support uh, and leadership to the industry. The health and well-being of the British construction industry is of paramount importance. Staff across CITB are working on multiple solutions to help the industry through this tough time. We will be providing regular updates on our website and through our social media channels to ensure our customers and partners are fully informed during this period. Now is the time for the UK construction industry to pull together. Thank you for your time and stay safe. Again, uh, I think this is a great example of giving advice to people who need it most. Uh, think of your apprentices, your employers, and actually any tradespeople who might have um, expiring cards or upcoming tests so they're unsure about how they're going to go about uh, getting those. Um, I didn't want uh, the start of this to come across as negative. However, I feel that it is a useful view um, on how the industry is feeling. Um, and I think now more than ever, uh, there's an opportunity for you to build that affinity and that loyalty uh, with your audience. Uh, everyone who works within the industry, whether you're a principal contractor, a supplier, or even a community like us, I think now is the time for us all to, to pull together and support the construction industry. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam. Uh, really interesting and quite uh, it's easy, easy to see why the, the construction industry uh, is so frustrated, isn't it? Uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, any questions? I've not had any through on the chat. Obviously, if you do have any, uh, if you can get them in quickly, that would be fantastic. And I can put them to Adam. Um, in the meantime, Will, um, while we were sort of transitioning over to Adam's section, we did get a, a last minute question in. So perhaps I'll just go back to you. Uh, to see if we do get any for Adam. Um, how do brands find the balance between marketing products and a softer approach of solving people's problems in the current climate? Yeah, it's a good question. It's, um, it's difficult for me to go into like a really uh, specific example and give specific advice without hearing more about, you know, the advertiser or who we're talking about, the, the lessons I've given a at the highest level of need to obviously be slightly tweaked and applied as necessary. But what I would say is look at if you can keep up with the demand, because if you can't, then you're just going to be creating more problems for yourself. Um, is it a really necessary product? Is it an essential product? Um, in which case I think leading more towards products is acceptable, but if not, then I think um, for all the reasons we talked about that, that brand activity that, you know, is reassuring and, um, it gives you a bit of a distraction is the way to go generally speaking it's even in the good times you should be looking at about 60 percent brand 40 percent products um and that's still the case now thank you will okay there's no other questions uh, for adam obviously if people do uh, want to ask anything after the event uh, do feel free the contact details will be provided shortly uh, we'll now move on um to the next section which is uh andy taylor will talk about the on a budget community the benefits of groups and consumer trends. Uh, so Andy is an early investor in On The Tools. He joined the team full-time as commercial director back in May 2016 and has been instrumental in the income growth of the business ever since. An early adopter of Facebook Lives, he is now a veteran of the format, having presented in excess of 100 live broadcasts. Uh, he has held a lifelong passion for conservation and is currently a non-executive director of Dudley Zoo, where he's an active member of the Board of Trustees. Andy, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for attending. Um, just on there. Uh, I'm going to talk about On A Budget, um, probably to introduce it to many of you. It's um, relatively new to Electric House. We've been developing and testing it over the past uh, 12 months or so since we brought it into the group. Um, on a budget community is, is a place for inspiration information and also it has to be said ego um, where people show off the projects in terms of DIY things that they've created 
uh, themselves. But however, it's, it's very much that ego that um, uh, provides the inspiration for other. It, it's a community for people who want to live their best lives without breaking the bank. Uh, and we call them the household warriors of Britain. As you can see here, it's almost the polar opposite in terms of gender split from on the tools. It's 92% female. Uh, and in total across the Facebook page and the closed uh, network of closed groups, which I'll discuss, uh, it has 2.8 million followers and is hugely engaged. If we look at that breakdown, um, the Facebook page itself, which we've been uh, focusing on for the past sort of six months or so, is now has 600,000 followers uh, and is gaining many more each, each day. I mean, as a community, it's never been so relevant for, you know, let's face it, for the foreseeable future, um, we're all going to be on a budget. Um, so it really works well at this time. We have eight close Facebook groups, uh, the sort of mothership, as it were, of those and the longest established is DIY on a budget, which is a closed Facebook group, uh, which has more than 1.7 million members. Um, and these are people that are just in, interested in improving their domestic surroundings uh, and still retains that very high female gender split. Um, <clears throat> alongside that, uh, an original offshoot was gardening on a budget, made sense to, to sort of differentiate that. Still very healthy with um, 275,000 members uh, in a closed group there. Uh, and then the new ones as we go down, uh, crafts at 85,000, cleaning at 64,000. Uh, cooking, uh, which is really developing quickly, as, as Will mentioned earlier, a lot of people are spending more time in their kitchens and, and looking at how to get the best and the most from their ingredients. So that's had a real upsurge in interest uh, over the past couple of months. And then we have parenting, uh, fashion, beauty, and probably the least relevant right now, which is travel on a budget. Uh, and how have we seen the effects of COVID-19 on, on the groups and on the channel itself? On the Facebook page, we've seen uh, in the first three weeks of April, uh, 44,000 new page followers, uh, which is a 277% increase on the previous period. And um, part of that is due to some paid strategy that we implemented just as a test, really. And Will also mentioned earlier that now is a real opportunity to grow communities. Um, within that testing, we found that we were able to grow the channel in terms of followers by up to 60% cheaper than earlier, just in earlier than this year. So whilst that ad inventory is low, it does seem a real opportunity to grow uh, your communities uh, and your following numbers. Um, in terms of the groups themselves, well, as people spend more time at home, it's no surprise that we've seen significant growth in the engagement within there. Within DIY on a budget, for example, the number of posts has increased by 43% in the past month. Uh, and the reasons for it are obvious, but that takes that engaged community even more engaged to somewhere in the region of uh, 1,100, 1,200 posts in the community every single day. Uh, and naturally what's followed with that is increasing engagement as well. And we've seen that comments have grown by 31% over the same period. Um, we uh, have an original content team uh, and they've been able to carry on producing content from their uh, domestic surroundings, which really works for on a budget. And, and we've doubled down on the on a budget um, content during this period. Just give you a couple of snapshots of what these look like. No, I won't. So <laughs> have a look at those at your leisure. Um, and what have we seen within the groups as well? We've looked at the trends. So we've analyzed what's been happening in those groups uh, and we've come up with the sort of the top five trends um, within the DIY and gardening groups. Uh, number one uh, trend at the moment seems to be painting front doors. A uh, nice example from Lauren in the top left corner there. <coughs> People are finding that they're even their UPVC doors that they're able to paint and are showing off uh, those within, within the group on a regular basis. You can probably see if you look closely the kind of reactions that people will get. So this one's had 340 positive reactions uh, on a post of, of a painting of a front door. So it's a really engaged, enthused and supportive uh, community. Next up is fainting, painting, uh, fainting fence, fence panels. Uh, painting fence panels is what's up next. Uh, and that's uh, been a big hit in the gardening group. As people meant to spend more time at home, the weather's been great, so people are, are taking to their gardens and trying to improve their surroundings there. Kitchen makeovers, naturally on a budget, so looking at how they can give it a fresh lift uh, in terms of its outlook by using cupboard paint. Uh, and for those with probably a much higher skill set than me, you can see in the bottom left here, 
It's the utilization of NDF, MDF to create wood wall paneling effects um, uh, to great effect down there. And you can see again, great engagement on that, over 500 reactions, over 100 comments, um, asking probably how they've done it and those sort of kinds of questions that you find within the group. Um, and also we've seen uh, a lot of people taking to their kitchens and bathrooms and trying to change the look of those through tile paint and tile transfers. Essentially what we're seeing is a whole lot of painting going on. It's a great time to be in the paint business, that, that's for sure. And we've also seen an increase in influencer content of people are spending more time at home. Um, they feel empowered to be able to create content themselves and post that back into the community. And this really creates like a perfect storm uh, in terms of social media marketing. Uh, the video that I'll hopefully play for you here involves a product called DC Fix, uh, which is a self-adhesive uh, vinyl product uh, that people use on hard surfaces to change their appearance. So doors, cupboard doors, tables, etc. Uh, they're a retained client of Electric House, uh, have regular content going into the group. And what they've seen is members of the group have been inspired to show the projects they've carried out using this. It's totally organic, we've not called for it. The example here, um, which I'll give it a whirl, received four and a half thousand comments. Um, Very basic, a good example of, of how a brand can really start to get brand advocates with, within the group itself. Benefits of groups as a whole, just to run through some of those key benefits there. Essentially, if you think of Facebook and how that content served to you, uh, by and large, um, it's, it's thrown at you. A lot of it's through the engagement of others. It's not content you've necessarily chosen to view and engage with. Whereas groups, you make a conscious decision to join and you join them because you're interested in the topic that you, you hope they're going to hold for you. Uh, and therefore, when you uh, are served content from the group, you're far more likely to engage with it um, and feel empowered to go there. It creates a content ecosystem. So as we've just seen in the example before, we're able to pull out content from our groups to then use on our channels. Um, and that's the case for on the tools as well as on a budget. Uh, and Facebook very much see them as a big part of the future of Facebook. You know, they've been very successful in joining the world together and now they wanna join the front room together and have these communities of like-minded people that have this considered content uh, and planned views of content. Uh, it, they've seen the engagement within groups is far higher than on the standard newsfeed. And also what groups offer to brands is uh, their own marketing opportunities. Groups, you know, brands can create their own groups. It's a place to really harvest and flourish brand advocates. It allows for more personal engagement because people see it as a safer space to be more open. It's an opportunity for a brand to get quick insights through polls and surveys and creates a sense of community around the brand, which is it's just building rapport and trust uh, and a whole new level for brands to get involved with. So that was sort of a whirlwind tour through on a budget and an introduction for it for many of you. Uh, I hope that um, you enjoyed that. If you've got any questions about on a budget or anything electric house in general, then please feel free to ask away. Thanks very much, Andy. Uh, yeah, really interesting. Um, I'm just conscious of time. So um, there, there hasn't been any questions come through that I can see. There was a couple earlier, one related to Adam's slot uh, and one to Will's slot from uh, Dylan Bennett and Mike Smith. Uh, we'll come back to you uh, separately with an answer on those guys, uh, just so you know you, you haven't been missed. Additionally, if there's anything else you'd like to discuss or if we can support you in any way, please also get in touch. Uh, my address, uh, as you can see, is on the current slide, uh, my email address there. Um, and also, if you've not managed to catch all of this webinar, uh, we will be putting a recorded version on the Electric House website, which you can, which you can find at electrichouse.co.uk. Uh, Dan, have I given you enough time there? No, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I'm almost there. Uh, Okay, we we actually do just have the one winner, uh, okay. who got uh, a full ten out of ten. Fantastic! And I can reveal that the winner is 
Dan Hirons. Congratulations, Dan. Um, we will be in touch with you um, and uh, give you the instructions on, on how you can redeem that voucher. Uh, congratulations and thank you very much. And that, that concludes the, the webinar, guys. Um, as I say, uh, please feel free to get in touch uh, via, via emailing myself, uh, which is on the current slide, or, or via electrichouse.co.uk, where the recorded webinar will be, uh, will be put. Um, have a great day, and thanks, thanks again, everyone.